Good evening, everyone. My name is Shawnee Harris. I am the Larry D. and Brenda A. Thompson Curator of African American and African Diasporic Art. And I'm pleased to present to you our artist panel, a distinguished panel of artists ex exhibiting in the uh, Kennedy and Austin galleries, um, or actually the, Ken uh, the Kennedy galleries more specifically, um, Expanding Tradition, um, which is a selection of works from the Larry and Brenda Thompson collection. Um, most of you probably know from, if you, if you attended the um, conversation on collecting um, a few weeks ago, uh, that the Thompsons are, of course, a very important part of um, the Georgia Museum of Art's um, trajectory um, in terms of its collection and the types of programming that we are um, put together. But also, um, one of the things that is most important to them is exposing um, the work of not only historical artists, but contemporary artists, um, and more specifically, living contemporary artists. Um, so what we, what we plan to do here tonight is to talk to some of the artists that are exhibiting in um, the galleries upstairs um, about their work, um, about their backgrounds, and about this um, whole notion of expanding tradition. Um, I kind of use the title Expanding Tradition as a play on um, tradition redefined, um, where the Thompsons are, you know, through their, through their collections, redefining, expanding the canon of American art. And now tonight we have um, artists who are continuously doing that through their consistent production and the work um, that they have um, created that's on display. Um, so in the background, I kind of we, you know, we, what we decided to do was to kind of show an array of images, um, but we're going to kind of do like we did the last time, where we kind of have a more broader discussion um, about the work, and then maybe center in on um, some works that are important to them and or current works that they are creating um, in this um, in this time period. So let me just introduce briefly um, so our panelists today. Um, to my right is Gregory Coates. Uh, who's a contemporary artist that's now living in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Believe it or not. Believe it or not. <laughs> so I was first exposed to um, Gregory's work um, through a gallery, um, was it Wilmer Jennings Gallery? Yeah, Wilmer Jennings, yes. Gallery in um, New York City. And the ironically, the, um, the, gallery, um, uh, the gallery, gallery director, um, her, her, um, her father's work is on display, is the, the central piece when you first walk into the expanding um, tradition exhibit. And so it's, it's, I'm, always, I'm always fascinated with how all of these people just dovetail, you know, artists, collectors, um, historical artists, contemporary artists, and how that, you know, tends to be a thread and how um, the Thompsons have brought all those stories together um, for us. Um, also to his right, <laughs> we have a very familiar figure, a lot of people know familiar with him, an Atlanta-based artist, Freddie Styles, um, and one of our own, um, Stephanie Jackson, who's a professor here at the Lamar Dodd School of Art. Um, to her right, Kevin Cole, nationally acclaimed artist. Carl Christian, also another Atlanta-based, nationally known artist, and Preston Sampson, um, who's a Maryland, DC, I call it the DMD area, <laughs> based artist. <laughs> so, um, so what I wanted to do tonight, I, I know I scared some of you about my topic. <laughs> I said, let's talk about the meaning of tradition and pie and so forth, but I didn't want you to feel as though, you know, you were hemmed in by that, because I feel like this, you know, that's kind of, a, a kind of a broad term that, you know, we can reinterpret by talking about your works. Um, but I figured that we, maybe we should open up a little bit by talking about um, your individual backgrounds um, and influences um, in terms of, like, maybe your, your, your training or your, um, what types of work you produce and so forth, and maybe some of your teachers or influences. So, We'll start out with you, Gregory. Okay, which one of those questions you want to ask? <laughs> <laughs> it's like actually on the spot. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, good timing. Uh, okay, influences. Influences in my work uh, are about what's not there. And what's not there is uh, this piece, the series pieces came out of death. My wife's 
father died. Uh, he had uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. He died from that, and he's German. He died from that, and she had to go back overseas to uh, attend to his funeral. I couldn't go. I had to take care of the dog we had at the time. And um, in the absence, I was mourning his death because I liked the guy. And uh, I was cleaning up some supplies, and uh, in one of my cleaning episodes, a pillow broke, a feather pillow. <clears throat> And I thought, I gotta throw this pillow away. Because the feathers, feathers are everywhere. And I said, no, 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 let me see what I can do with this. This, this must be about something. So I took the feathers and I, I calmed down. I thought, collage. So I took these feathers and I started to make these paintings based on the need to, to have a ritual, to, to be condensed in some time so I could mourn. Uh, I lost myself in the work, and I made black paintings out of the feathers uh, for mourning and loss. And then after the mourning period, I came into the affirmation of life, and that's when I changed to the colors. So these pieces came from the loss and then the understanding of life mm -hmm. and what was not there. So inspiration can come from, you know, empathy. A variety of places. Yes. Does it answer you? Yeah, it does answer. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure sometimes. I ramble so. <laughs> so I think I think uh, the next set of um, images was um, Preston Sampson. So very different. Like you know, you were talking a lot about emotion, um, and with uh, Preston's with your work, I see a lot of imagery of people, historical figures, and, and, and so forth, um, or historicizing of um, figures. Can you talk a little bit about your, um, your influences and so forth? Well, I'd say, you know, a good deal of my influences come from uh, storytelling. Mm -hmm. They come from, I often say, the stories of old black men, and black women, for that fact. You know, um, it, it's always about, uh, you know, a connection between, you know, stories from the past, you know, whether it were the, the Negro leagues, you know, the piece that's in uh, Brenda and Larry's exhibit with the, uh, the workmen, it, it came from a, a period um, when it was a loss of, you know, um, labor and, and, and people's uh, ability to be blue collar, you know, the, the, the story behind where we came from the lawyers and the doctors and the accountants. At some point, there was somebody who had a label on their shirt. You know, um, they, they worked in a mill, they worked in some kind of factory, or, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a blue collar job. Many people was the first generation. I mean, I was, my, my siblings were the first generation college educated in my family. Mm -hmm. So it's also, you know, like paying homage to the, the, the people who came before us is something I'm, I feel very strongly about. Mm -hmm. And uh, as well as like materials. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a colorist and also uh, a material person. You know, I like to, to, to cross over with different mediums, whether it's acrylic, mixed media, and caustic printmaking. So I play, tend to play with, with surfaces and, and mediums uh, to, to try to deliver the general, uh, you know, message of what I would like to do. Also, and it's a strong black male, which is my, always the central basis of, I think, everything that I do. So, so really this connection between, you mentioned loss, like both of you kind of in your own way, you mentioned loss and, um, but you, you, exhi you exhibit that in a variety of different ways. For you, like the materials, mm -hmm. but also for you as well, the materials are, are quite important. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe we could talk a little bit about, like, you know, of course, Gregory, your work is much more abstract. Mm -hmm. um, what is, can you, can any of you speak about, like, your choice of using figuration and abstract, for figuration or abstraction in your work? Um, because that's always been this debate, like, historically about people, particularly um, African American artists, you know, deciding whether they want to move toward abstraction or whether they want to move toward figuration in their, in their individual works of art? Well, I can. Um, it's interesting. 
Gregory reminded, well, he didn't remind me of something, but there's a theme. My earlier work was very figurative. I started illustrating, and when my mother drew me this chicken, <laughs> I said, Mommy, draw me something, so she drew me a chicken. So I started copying my mother's chicken, and then I just started drawing things I saw around me, and then eventually, at some point, these figures crept into my work, and I kept saying, who are these people? <laughs> and in 1979, <laughs> Uh, my fraternal grandmother died, and my mother, father, sister, and I were together as a family unit for the first time in many, many years. So after my return to Atlanta from that experience, I realized that my earlier figurative works were illustrating painful family issues. And I said, I don't want to do that anymore. So I thought about how I had survived, I'm not going to get into the details of the abuse, but I've been abused in every imaginable way. I'm not going to get into the details, but I started to figure out or think about how I had survived that abuse and I always turned to nature. So my work started to evolve from figurative, I didn't want to illustrate that at some point I got counseling to deal with those issues. So my work started to to focus on how I had survived. I would always turn to nature, so from about 1980 until now, my work is kind of rooted in the natural world around me. I even at some point started to use plant roots to apply paint. I currently, since I don't find good roots anymore, I use pine needles to apply paint. So. And ultimately, I think it's a celebration of just being alive and seeing all of the wonderful things around us in our everyday lives. <coughs> Kevin? <laughs> well, I, well I, I, with just to give you a little background, I'm from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. I did my undergraduate at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. I received my master's in art education from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana and a master's of fine arts and drawing at Northern Illinois University. Um, my influences, they were, they, were, they, they were my professors in undergrad, Terrence Corbin, Henry Linton, the, 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 the late John Howard, who was friends with Hale Woodruff. But I think for me, as you know, everybody always re rely on the concept and the ideas of my work. Um, um, when I graduated from high school, I didn't want to go register to vote. And my grandfather I owned a lot of property in rural Arkansas, told me to go stand beside this tree, and I did, and I came back. I told him I had this scary feeling. He informed me African Americans had been lynched by the necktie, I don't know where to vote. Mm -hmm. So the necktie image always have appeared in, in the, in the uh, work. And then I started using these uh, 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 scarf images in the work. And I started to deal with the concept of form, shape, and, uh, and the whole idea of a relationship between sight, sound, and color and, and in aspects of music. So for me, uh, all of my pieces have a positive t t title to them, such as uh, um, Scattered Blessings. And gr growing up in Arkansas, that was, that was important to me in the work. And I always try to make sure that the medium I use have something to do with the concept. When you think about it, these pieces are on wood. So I started the Blanket Series in 2011. I was in, I was in Denver, and I, I saw a tapestry show. And on, on my way back, m my mom, I stopped to see her. And she used to be a housekeeper. So I looked, looking at how she was folding everything. So I started folding the, the wood. And in 2000, and, and in, in, well, um, I was supposed to be in New York on September 11th. I saw it just so happened I didn't, I didn't go. A friend of mine, Eric Mack, went. He was sending me back a lot of photographs, and that was a little, a little boy holding a, a, a piece of tar paper and, and steel. So I started working on, a, on aluminum as my protest of September 11. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you know, but to this very day, there are 1,011 remains of people who have not been identified mm -hmm. that happened in September 11. Peter Jennings, who, who was one of my favorite news persons, he was talking about it. And he was saying it would cost the government pennies to find out who they are. Mm. So I started working on copper mm. as my protest against that. So the medium becomes a part of, uh, it's so important in me making my work. But, you know, 
with the new work, a lot of people say, wow, I like the old stuff. I said, well, I don't have any. I mean, I'm, I'm not doing it anymore. But I think that the blanket series is, is something that I think that, you know, when you think about the blanket, you know, you're covered, being covered with the blanket. And I think that the positive titles, even though you talk about lynching, but we moved on. Mm -hmm. You know, and so uh, that whole idea of abstraction and then dealing with concept, for me, is real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, um, it, you know, it's interesting how, um, you know, based on what all of you have discussed, that there's this running th thread of personal narrative, um, but also connecting with larger, you know, world events and, and, and so forth. And I was wondering, um, in terms of the, um, this kind of rarefied art world, like, how do you see your work um, kind of reacting to this, and I would say rarefied art world, but this kind of imagined art world that's kind of, you're involved in. Um, do you see yourself as kind of speaking to that as well in some of your works, or, um, or is it something that um, you kind of, you know, you're oblivious to, you just, you just create, um, you know, according to, Basically, like, how does the how does the how does the um, the like the contemporary art world? How do you see yourself in it? Like, you oh, Stephanie. It's Stephanie. Yeah. <laughs> I just want my work to speak to people who respond to it. They don't have to be art connoisseurs or people that necessarily frequent art galleries or museums. And um, it's, it's not important to me how an art critic might respond to the work versus just a regular person who may or may not have a, a background in art. Sometimes I find it challenging myself to have to, I just want to look at a work and be able to perhaps get something from it and not have to know so much about the artist or where they're coming from or what their past work was. I just want to look at the work and let the art speak for itself. Mm -hmm. And I find a lot of art, um, sometimes you, you need to, um, you know, almost have a, a degree in something in order to be able to interpret it. So that, that's not necessarily the audience that I'm after in my work, because I feel like it's almost exclusionary. And I want my work to be, uh, include people Mm -hmm. to, and maybe, um, not necessarily that abstraction cannot be inclusionary, but just for me, in my work, figuration, and maybe a storytelling, like Preston was saying, um, is more important to me in terms of what I'm doing. And, and it also has to do sometimes with, with what you've seen when you're younger. Mm -hmm. You know, I had, I was fortunate enough to grow up in Detroit and we had the wonderful Detroit Institute of Arts and the Diego Rivera murals were there and many other sort of wonderful art and also Romare Bearden um, showed in downtown Detroit and also in a particular uh, gallery outside of Detroit and so I was fortunate to be able to see his work and responded uh, to it and then when I went to New York at an early age uh, the Stidium Museum of Harlem was still on the second floor, I think, in 7th Avenue. I just remember walking up all these steps, and um, the, they, show, they were showing people like Bette Saar and just a lot of very wonderful artists, so that for the most part, they tend to have been representational, even though they might have been conceptual at the same time. And so I just responded to those works. In addition to that, I've always been uh, gravitated towards uh, the literary tradition. So in addition to thinking visually, I, I was very much taken with the Harlem Renaissance writers, Langston Hughes, his poetry, uh, and then fortunate to come up during the time of Toni Morrison and James uh, Baldwin. and. Um, people of, of that nature, so that also influenced my work in terms of wanting to, I guess, talk about my life and things that I experienced in the paintings themselves. So, so what about artistic mentors? Like, I, I remember at dinner, Gregory, mm. you were talking about Al Loving 
Um, yeah. And, um, Joel know, Street. And, Joel Street. Um, yeah. And then Kevin, um, I know Sam Gilliam. Yes. And the important mm -hmm. that, how um, important was that in shaping any of your careers? Um, well, I think for me, it was Sam Gilliam. He told me what not to do. <laughs> you know, who do, uh, you know, how do you, how do you get your work out there? And he also talked about um, the, the idea of you never want to be where you were on yesterday. The work needs to keep evolving and changing. And I think that's one thing that stayed in my mind. But I think that a lot of African American artists, you, you know, you had people that you look up to. You know, they would were, they were pull you aside. And I, I remember uh, Benny Andrews, I, I met Benny when I was 13 years old mm -hmm. at, the, at the Arkansas Arts Center. Then I met Charles White, who was incredible, because Charles White was a chain smoker. And this old lady <laughs> raised her hand and asked him um, how often does he sell? He said, ma'am, as soon as I finish the piece, it's so, next question. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I want to be just like him. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so Carl, like, what about uh, what about you? You um, you grew up in in Alabama. Yes, I was born in Bessemer, Alabama. I grew up in a small town. Uh, well, was it even a town? A community? There were coal mining towns, mm -hmm. and uh, about ten miles from Bessemer. Bessemer uh, was the city for me. Um, it was uh, full of nature. <laughs> uh, we grew everything. We had, everybody had cows and everybody had fields and everybody had chickens and uh, it was just those kind of things. Um, I don't know how much Do you have that has had an effect yeah. on my work, but nature is a great part <laughs> and also industry. I always say that mm -hmm. I was born, I'm a country boy, but I was born in the country, but I'm really a city boy. <laughs> but um, I, uh, if you look at some of those, I, I, uh, as far as nature and industry is concerned, I, I just have this thing about um, the way nature plays on industry. I, you know, it comes. Nature, our industry gets it shiny and new, but by the end it's all rusty, kind of uh, and old, like like we are or will be. And but I don't think that's ugly, really. I think it's beautiful. I love rusty things. I I just I, I right now I go and pick up little uh, rusty bottle tops and saws and things. I find beauty in that. And sometimes I I have collections, collections, and don't always use what I have, the rusty nails, the rusty um, things, but sometimes I can use them in my art. And um, uh, those pieces are on wood uh, dresser drawers. I just don't throw a lot of things away. Like <laughs> yeah. Alabama people, you know? Those are dresser drawers with the, you see the outlet at the top of that one and the, uh, what you call it? Kinch. Kinch. Yeah. And uh, I have a collection of rusty hinges. I like the rusty ones. I, um, and I, I just used, try to put them and organize them in an artistic way that's beautiful also to look at. And like Stephanie, it's really, it's really for me. I hope my audience likes it. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. I appreciate it. But that's not Do the it for most yourself, important share it with thing mm -hmm. to me. Um, I'm trying to, uh, you know, bring some other things in. Oh, did you want to talk to this? Um, oh, yeah, I, I, I was one of the lazy artists. I did not select my own slides. There was the letter <laughs> series. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to the letter uh, series piece of here, uh, if you can. I have done some video yeah, pieces. My one of uh, the uh, nice pieces I that's a time that Larry bought for me was that a image is a piece, mother. but it was an old piece from 1994, I believe, and um, they donated <coughs> that piece to the museum, and she was, and, and Larry both uh, really loved the piece and wanted another figure piece, and I hadn't done one in a long, long time, and um, they, she, uh, Brenda looked through my work. There's some things I had started ten years and put down, and that I would, I promised to go back to. It took me two years to go back to figurative, and uh, um, 
Terry Davis would know this story too. <laughs> <laughs> Two years ago, his figurative piece back. But I am uh, also doing figurative pieces, but I still manage to incorporate my found objects, my, uh, my textual things. The textuals, I guess, is, it's, it's more than the fine objects. Nice, I'm going to talk about the meta series. So um, I'm, getting, I'm getting a um, cue from Freddie. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we should talk about this letter series oh. <laughs> that, that we have this image. In um, 2003, I was invited to a show in Birmingham. It was the 50th, the Birmingham's 50th commemoration of their part in the civil rights struggle uh, from 1963. And um, I, as an abstract artist, I just knew that I would be doing the dogs barking and the policemen and those kinds of things. But I, I, I collect things. I have just all kinds of things. I had these letters. They were uh, vowel and crude from my uncle. He would uh, put them out in his yard for people to read to not come to his house. But he told me I could have them. But uh, I researched a little bit in the, uh, how letters were so important in that movement. Of course, there's the letter from the Birmingham jail. There's the letters that, um, um, what's the baseball great wrote to the president? Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Uh, Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson. He wrote to the president from Truman on up to uh, Nixon, I believe. He just kept writing letters uh, for them to get involved and do things. So they were positive letters. And of course, they were mean and ugly letters to anyone who, to white people or black people who were sympathetic to the, the plight of the uh, civil rights people. So I uh, did a series, uh, they wanted three. I ended up doing 12 in all, and uh, this was not one of the ones selected, but um, um, I call them my letter series. Mm -hmm. And I put this figure in a few of them. That's my grandmother at the top, uh, Miss Beatrice Brown, uh, who passed away in 79. Mm -hmm. um, she was uh, one of the people who I, I, that was just as a tribute to her, the, the people who endured so much and never got to see. Uh, Barack Obama and, and some of the other uh, wonderful things that has did happen after their their lives, but 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 we're back to endure. And in the series, some of them I use car tags and uh, a little bit of everything, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, and I mean, I'm always fascinated when, um, particularly when I see your work with all of the the, the use of all the different material you mentioned the rusty nails and the rusty materials. Um, and I was wondering, um, in terms of your, um, I mean, in all of you, um, in terms of your, uh, your, your particular training or your, um, your background, did you find that you um, chose specific materials because you were kind of, I, I guess what I'm hearing is that you were led kind of personally to um, certain materials rather than it necessarily being through training um, per se. Um, that you might have had some formative training, you know, through, you know, um, certain, um, you know, for, through your education and so forth, but you still made it your own. Um, yes, I was a music major actually, and I got a master's in music ed. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, after that master's, I went to school for, um, at the time they call it commercial art. That was before computers and everything. In 83, that's when I graduated. So, uh, and I took some uh, figure drawing classes at the Atlanta College of Art, which is what it was called at that time. And I uh, taught art um, along with music um, in uh, elementary school for about 10 years. And I kept taking classes and kind of developing my, my own kind of sense of style or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Can I add on to that? Um, sure. You know, I was a trained painter at University of Maryland. Uh, but, you know, I, I began going into different mediums, for instance, pole painting, which I did quite a few of, handmade paper. That came by, you said, was it a choice or just organic? And it was organic. Mm -hmm. I went to do a uh, monotype series at the Pyramid of Melanic for a commission I had. They weren't ready for me. So 
in the meantime, this woman, Helen Frisbee, said, hey, when you do some pulp painting? I'm like, what's that? Never heard of it. I started playing with it. I fell in love with it. I did that for a good 10 years. You know, I did that, you know, not exclusively, but that became part of my, you know, art DNA. The next thing was encaustics, how I kind of stumbled into that. I was asked to teach a class uh, for encaustics. Never heard of it. I, I looked at, you know, YouTube, uh, how to do encaustics. I asked my friends. <laughs> and then I was stupid enough to tell my class, hey, I don't know anything about this. I'm learning just like you all. They were like, really? Paying my money for it. <laughs> but the great irony of that, the very first piece I did practicing with the students, end up going to one of the dynamite collectives, a wonderful piece. I was playing. I didn't know what I was doing. So <laughs> as you talk about how things happen and how you go into, you know, how one medium goes into another, because I agree with, with Kevin. It, you going. keep going. You know, it, you know, it's people expect to see what you did 15 years ago. And if they see it, because I've got a show, I think she's in it, September break. Yeah, she is. <laughs> I have a show, White Lord, but her open next Friday. The people who know my work from Camille, it's not what they're going to see. Mm -hmm. And it's different. And I think that's what we all do. And then I think what Stephanie said, they like it, they bet. If they don't, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, we're doing it for, you know, it's your personal, it's your, your statement. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I feel like, hey, for me, being an artist and an educator, you try different things. And, and, and in education, you're trying to teach kids different things. And, and you stumble on things that really matter to you and your concept. And, you know, like he said, I mean, I, I've done prints. And I've worked with several, several master printers. But the, the thing I enjoy the most is that experimentation. And once it works, it works. And, but at the same time, for me, one of the reasons I got into art is because of my speech impediment. That was my way of communicating. So, so that, that material, those things always appear to come back into the, back into the work. And as you said, and I, and I was, you know, you, you, it's funny because you meet a, a lot of students. And I had a group of students in my studio a couple weeks ago. They came over 3,000 miles to talk to me about my work. Only thing they wanted to know is how did I get Michael Jordan to buy a piece and how did I do a mural for the Olympics? And I'm like, you come this far, did they, nobody asked me how many hours I put in there, how many days a week I get in the studio. But it was just that, you know, it's, it, it, was, it was really interesting to, you know, for them to, to talk about that. You know? so, so you mentioned um, being an educator. How, how many of you could, for, for the audience, are like full-time arts educators, like in terms of teaching art to? That's my last year. <laughs> <laughs> How many years is it, can I ask? <laughs> 32. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, 32 years. High school and college. High school. And we know Stephanie has been an educator here on campus for several years, so. Uh, decades. Yeah, yeah decades. <laughs> 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 and Carl, you're. I'm retired, 38 <laughs> years. Okay, you're already retired. Wow. <laughs> yeah, because I was wondering, like, um, how does being an educator and actually teaching students, like, you know, the, uh, you know, certain media, how does it affect your ability to create or get, give you, does it give you new ideas, like in just teaching other students? Well, I, c I could talk a little bit about that because I, um, I've been through the spectrum. I was um, a designer and illustrator in New York in my first career, and then I gave that up to uh, be a full-time studio artist. And so I lived in New York and also New Orleans for approximately 10 years just supporting myself on my art. And then eventually moved into the academia, as they would say. And I would just say it's whatever works for that individual artist. I found teaching to enrich my life as an artist. It gives you freedom. You don't have to worry about whether you're, you're selling in the gallery or not. You don't have to worry about whether yeah. your work, it, when work does sell in the gallery, they want more of the same because they know that's what sells. 
Um, and so there's a freedom being having an income stream that's independent from the sale of your works. It allows you just to make art. Yeah. And um, so I've always felt blessed to be in that situation and also you know, sometimes you're supported with the studio. Sometimes you're supported with grants, mm -hmm. and um, and I think the artists who don't have that type of situation are just haters. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I I so much admire these new group of young artists. When I say young, I mean anybody mid 30s or younger who c are coming up at a time when they can if given the right situation and the right pedigree they can support themselves off their art yeah. and i say more power to them because you know maybe 30 years ago that wasn't really possible there are a lot of amazing especially african american artists who worked some sort of job into retirement and then at that point were able or they married well you know, right. that's, <laughs> that sort of thing. So I say kudos to the young artists who have the following and have the collectors that they can set up a studio practice and maintain that with just their work. But I don't think artists who took a different route should somehow be like looked down upon because there's advantages to that too for the, for the long haul. Right. Yeah. And, and trust me, there are very few Brendan and Larry Thompson <laughs> yeah. Well, Stephanie, I'll have to say that I've done a residency here and there, now and then, <laughs> but I never taught uh, on a regular basis. Um, at some point, I decided I didn't want to teach anybody anything I had to go to school for or whatever. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do my work. Mm -hmm. But in doing and surviving as an artist, um, I've done other things. Um, my sister and brother-in-law have a cleaning business and in 1980 something I think it was my sister called and said Freddie we've gotten a larger contract will you come and help us until we can hire somebody. So after two or three days of cleaning a building I said I'll do this I show up I do this you know aerobics for pay. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> As an artist, I think a lot of artists here can relate to this, that whenever you see paper of any kind, you collect it. Mm -hmm. So I saw this in roll of thermal fax paper, you know, the one on the roll. So I took it home, and in my work, I've always done texture. I crumpled paper to do texture and whatever. So I crumpled a piece of this thermal fax paper, and I noticed that something came off of it. I said, oh, what have we here? So through trial and error, I learned to exploit that kale encoding on that thermal fax paper to create, probably if I have a successful series, one of my most successful series studies in, you know, the new acquisitions you had up mm -hmm. was done with that fax paper. So right. in having to clean up a building, <laughs> not being a teacher, <laughs> not having a steady income, <laughs> I discovered that thermal fax paper, which led to, you know, one of my more successful series. And uh, the way it's done, I get paint on the fax paper in doing it. Then I save the papers and recycle those into collage, which kind of created my second most successful series, my evolving series. <laughs> you know, so there are benefits to having to do other stuff. <laughs> So it lends to the creativity. Yeah, it, yeah, it lends to the creativity. Yeah. And the ingenuity. I have a, uh, a story of how I got into it as well. Is, um, in 90, I was in South Africa. And I had a shipment of art supplies that I had sent with me on, my, on the plane trip. And it somehow got lost or stolen yeah, or whatever. That happens. And uh, it had messed up my whole like, agenda. I thought I was going to go over there and paint. <laughs> and I got over there and I didn't have anything. So I said, well, I'm going to be here for two months. And I started to cry. I cried for two days. And then I realized that I'm an artist. And as an artist, you're trained to do what you can, <laughs> problem solve. Mm -hmm. So I decided to use dirt, mud, brown paper, coffee grinds, stains. I started to experiment because I had no one to tell me I couldn't. Yeah. 
And uh, I got into materials and painting and creation and freedom. And I, and I learned I had a crutch. And I said, I'm going to break that crutch by being able to do what I want. So I gave myself permission. And while I was there, we wound up the, the stay, uh, a young African person who was part of the, the, the residency, he asked these two Dutch artists who had made this A-frame, one-story house if he could have the materials. And the Dutch guy said to him, what are you going to do, uh, make art? And he said, no, I'm going to live in it. And I said, oh my god. That's pretty heavy. Here's a guy, we're here making art, but then you have these people who need s sustainable materials to live in. Right. At the time, I was doing a residency in Harlem at the Studio Museum. So I went back to Harlem, and all in the streets of Harlem were materials, yeah. source material. Mm -hmm. I started picking up glass, broken everything, and I pulled them into my studio. And I thought I had a moral <laughs> imperative to use this stuff, mm -hmm. because somewhere in the world, someone would rather have it to live it. And that got me involved in just making use of the history of materials and, and in invention. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it led me to just sort of do what I'm doing now. Empathy, you mm -hmm. know, of some kind. But uh, I, don't, I don't have a job. And when I was there, we, there was a bunch of us sitting around. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, there were Europeans and Africans from different parts of Africa. I went around and asked every last one of those people, what do you do for a living back in your home country? How do you make money? And they all say, I just make art. And I go, you know what? I come from the superpower, and I'm working <laughs> in a bar. <laughs> well, but you guys are making it work? <laughs> I said, I'm going to go back to my job. And I went back to see Sharon, who's been a very good person to me. I said, Sharon, I'm quitting. She goes, you're quitting? I said, yeah, I'm quitting. I got to do something. I got to see if it can work. And I never looked back. Mm -hmm. But it was a wake-up call, because if you put yourself in that position, I did anyway, I was like frightened to do it. But it's a struggle. We live yeah. like, you know, we live like on a fixed income. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I got debts and bills that, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think it's something that, you know, in all of our lives we look back and say, well, I did, I did my best, mm -hmm. you know. So one kind of final broad question, and then I'm going to um, open it up for some questions, is how do you, I mean, you know, kind of this is probably the question that gets asked at all these types of panels is how do you see um, your work in relation to kind of the history and culture of the African diaspora? And I say it broadly, you know, um, rather than ne necessarily um, African-American art, do you see your work as kind of playing into like any historical themes or so forth, or do you see it pretty much um, independent as an individual artist um, of that larger tradition? Um, I'm still thinking about that. Can we, we you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like um, uh, Al Loving once said, you, 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 you try to catch up to your head. You, you're here, but you're, you're thinking right. elsewhere. Right. Right. So um, uh, we were having this conversation about where, where your art's going to be, mm -hmm. yeah. who's going to take care of it, right. your, yeah. you know, your absence. Uh, I guess that's where you come in, huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and the Thompsons. <laughs> and the Thompsons. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> my own position, you know, like, that becomes like a touchstone question is, what does it really mean to be the curator of the African diaspora? Mm. Um, and what does it mean for the artists that you study? You know, how do they see themselves in relation to that or at all? Um, because that's always been, I mean, historically the debate is, am I an artist or am I a black artist? And I mean, or am I both? Am I, you know, or you transcend race, you transcend culture, um, what, you know. I check all the boxes, you know. <laughs> right. I, mean, I, mean, I check all the boxes. Well, you know, one of the strange things, I was, I was at Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I'm fortunate to have a piece in a new collection, and I was talking to a white friend of mine, mm -hmm. and he was saying, well, why was that so important to you to be in there? And, I, didn't, I thought about it for a minute, and, and I'm like, but 
you know how many other museums or how many years it took to get in that one? I mean, yeah, I'm in Yale's collection and whatever, but to me that was so important because a lot of artists who I studied with, they're in there, yeah. you know? And when, when you look at you, you're beside them, you know, and all the hell they went through. Like, and I always say that I think that all of us are standing on somebody else's back, especially being a, being a black abstract artist or a realistic artist. And I always say that I walk in and out of two worlds, one black and one white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would like, to, I'm not sure exactly what the question is anymore, but something about what, fitting into the tradition of African American yeah, and, or art or making, there, or is right. there a tradition? Right. I think that we can only make art about the things that we've experienced. Mm -hmm. And for some African Americans, we grew up being mentored by other African American artists, like Al Loving, which coincidentally I was also mentored by, he being from Detroit, he was the one that told me, you can be an artist, you can make art, you don't have to just be a designer or whatever I was doing at the time, and you know, just go paint. And yeah. even though he was abstract and yeah. I was figuration, it, it didn't matter. And I mean, it's just this thing that if the art I'm making sort of reflects a sense of black life is it's like, excuse me, that's wh who I grew up with. That's my neighborhood. Yeah. Detroit was like 80, 90% black. I mean, these are the people around me. So the life I talk about is the life that I've lived, the experiences that I've had, whether it be, you know, the riots in Detroit or, you know, things historically that interest me. Uh, one of the paintings in the slide was the uh, riot in 1906 in Atlanta. You know, or, you know, that sort of thing has resonance for me in terms of the riots in Detroit or just how we are treated or wanting to sort of create my own sense of revisionist history versus how we were depicted historically. And I find it interesting in today's culture, whether you're looking, whether you're reading the book Underground or whether you're looking on television at the, at the series Underground by John Legend, it's like, People are coming back to say, no, this is what we were about. This is what's happening. So that we can go back historically and make art be, have art that resonates with us, or we can look you know, forward. We can be futuristic. That's a whole nother movement. Mm -hmm. But it's not about wanting not to make paintings about white culture. I mean, it's not about white or black culture. It's about who we are and how we experience life. And, and so I sometimes resent it when people say, why do you just paint black people? I'm like, does anyone ask a white artist why they just paint white people? Like, when, I don't recall being anywhere, hearing anyone ask a, someone on a panel that. It just strikes me as really kind of bizarre that, that they can't look through other people's like eyes. Yes. And, and I find that interesting. I think it's our role as artists to try to get people to look at things a different way, be it through abstraction or, or through like figuration. And it's exciting to see parallels in the movies and in literature and in music, you know, to be talking about these things. So uh, it's really kind of an exciting time as, and a perilous time, but a very exciting time. Yeah. Well, I, I'll try to, <laughs> with this. <laughs> Well, like I said earlier, that my earlier, more figurative pieces were about painful family issues, painful family issues, but at some point, my figurative pieces weren't that great, you know? When you're dealing with the human body, there's just so many ingredients you have to work with. <laughs> <laughs> you know, head, shoulders, arms, torso. Stephanie does it beautifully. <laughs> Charles White did it marvelously. Freddie Styles did. So I turned to another reality. All around us, like even in this room, if you could magnify the air, there's stuff in it. One of the most defining moments in my life was that first drop of dirty water I saw in biology class. That all around us are these realities that have nothing to do with heads and shoulders and stuff that are just as real. Mm -hmm. So in terms of a tradition, I guess I kind of stepped off of the path of illustrating the human body to 
kind of join a tradition of maybe Norman Lewis and folk like that? Mm -hmm. Sam Gilliam, those mm -hmm. are, are my idols. Mm -hmm. And I've sometimes been criticized for not doing social commentary mm -hmm. relevant. I was at a talk recently with, I think Alfred Conte was there and somebody was there and I yeah. said, let's do an experiment here. <laughs> I said, let's put one of your really relevant pieces on the wall and one of my beautiful non-relevant pieces on the wall and sit <laughs> and see which one gonna get off the wall and do something. <laughs> we will be here for a while. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and if there's a social, I think, kind of, uh, <laughs> A social aspect to my work. I think that Freddie Styles can be total, do totally, has as much right to do totally abstract, non objective work as Jackson Pollock and all those others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> and, and beautifully done, yeah. Freddie Styles. Beautifully done. Yeah. Yeah. I was here sitting next to you while you told that story like that. Well, I'll always remember that, the way you told that story. I have to say this, they only let me out of the home once or twice a month. <laughs> <laughs> I have to make the best of it. <laughs> Nobody can top that. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's, you might want to see well, if there's any questions that. and yeah. And then we'll move on. Well, you invited me, dear. Yes. <laughs> so this has been great. This has been great. I want to um, I want to thank you all for for coming to uh, tonight. I um, actually there was one less panelist that you might have seen on earlier um, promotional um, materials, and that is Amalia Maki, who's on mm -hmm. our board, um, who unfortunately um, could not be here tonight. Um, but we just kind of remember her, and we see. We'll be going upstairs for a few minutes to look at work, and um, her work is included there. Um, and it's funny because before the uh, before the panel began, everyone was those who were on the last panel for tradition redefined lamented Amalia not being here because they said, "Well, if Amalia's not here, how are we going to know <laughs> how much to talk?" <laughs> yeah, she can talk. Yeah. <laughs> she's a quite eloquent speaker. Yes. Um, and and, her videos, yeah. and so forth. But I think you all have done a pretty good job here tonight. <laughs> so what I wanted to do is for just for a few minutes um, is to open it up for people who might have questions for the artists um, in terms of their work or their careers and so forth. These are three questions, right? Uh-oh. Uh-oh, there's <laughs> one. Did you say uh-oh? <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I would like to thank you because I'm very inspired by this evening. Um, I want to thank you because you really do bring something to the table that's not there in the culture. <laughs> Going into the age we're in now where uh, creation and artistic uh, pursuits seem to not be as recognized on a larger scale, what are some of your visions for how that can be attacked? Mm. Uh, and what kind of future do you see for artists, period, but particularly for African Americans? You know, when you look at it at the uh, right now, some of the highest paid or, or most successful artists in New York are African American artists. Uh, fortunately, a lot of them have come from Yale, 
Um, but when you look at uh, <laughs> when you look at the other idea, and I've, I've taught high school, I've been in magnet programs and taught teach college, and um, um, I always instill in parents, you know, coming to a magnet program, they, uh, the parents, you know, you're going to be a lawyer, and then they come and take art class with me. No, I want to get in the arts. Everything is designed by somebody, from the clothes we wear, from I mean everything. And you look at technology. Uh, trying to infuse it in there, and I just I, I kind of made my last principal mad because because I say I can go and run this school, I can go teach math, I can go teach science, but can't nobody come and teach my class. That's how important the arts are, and now they got they have a lot of STEM programs that are, are being innovated, are, are being uh, they're uh, they're putting the arts as a major part of it, and when you look at history. They'll come back and look at what artists were doing. We documenting history, and I think that um, a, a lot of the in education, you know, the, you know, and it kind of it, it freaks you out because everybody they want to be a computer whiz or a math whiz or sciences, but they, the the arts is a billion dollar industry. If you look at Art Basel in, in Miami, they spend billions of dollars in, in from their Wednesday through their Sunday. And, and, and I always tell, I was always told there's no, no such thing as a starving artist. There's such thing as a starving, lazy artist. <laughs> no, he didn't. Because you learn. <laughs> because you learn, as all of us, you, you know, you learn how to, how to make a living, but there's nothing like waking up in the morning and doing what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think that, that what was happening with some of the most successful schools, they, they understood the artist problem solving. Art is really problem solving. I mean, we've been doing it for for years, and I I just think that education is just now catching up to the uh, the, the visual arts. And if you look at any good high school program, if they have a successful music department, art department, they have high SAT scores. What was the question again? I'm, I'm, I'm. <laughs> Basically, looking forward, um, what are the Freddie, well, that's, like, that's about resistance and education, right? Mm -hmm. And integration and community and uh, persistence. It's all the good things that, that make us do what we do every day, even though we know we're going to die after so many years of it. We have the um, fortitude to say we can make a change, mm -hmm. we can make something better. Uh, not to get too off the case, but uh, I, I think it's food for thought. You know, like what I do, I don't know who will look at it and how will it affect them, but I do it because what I do gives people food for thought, and all of these people, food for thought. Mm -hmm. And that food for thought is something that if they didn't do it, they, didn't have, they wouldn't have the information to feed on. So we do things not knowing who it will affect, but it will affect, and I think in a very positive manner. So we're here to continue the ecosystem of our humanity, and, prevent, and, and provide food for thought in that way. That's what I think. <laughs> well, I think on a very practical 149 Candler Road point of view, Where's that at? <laughs> is to get people like yourself, <clears throat> your neighbors, your friends to invest in us, to collect what we do. I often say that at some point, a starving artist is like a raggedy old car broke down side the road and a purchase gets it to the next level and gets it to the next level. A lot of wonderful artists out there have withered on the vine because no one came along to get them to that next level. And we really need to find a way to clone Brenda and Larry Thompson. <laughs> because they have bought batteries, gas, tires, <laughs> <laughs> call the wrecker, you know. They are just marvelously supportive. They, I call them my de Medici's. 
And Kevin can probably say the same thing. Yeah. Carl might can too. Yep, and, and pay child support. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm proud of being a question. Question in the back. <laughs> um, I have a question. So in, in our class, we discussed the term African-American artist um, instead of just American artist. And I was curious how um, you guys thought about that term and how you consider yourself as an artist. Do you consider yourself an African-American artist or would you prefer to be just labeled as an American artist? And do you believe that being um, titled an African-American artist could possibly set you back um, from being uh, considered just an American artist. Mm. Uh, can, oh I, can I start with this one? This, oh, the rest go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> this takes me back to Cape Town. And I'm sitting in Cape Town with all these people from various parts of Africa. And we're having a campfire. So they all come up to me, the African brothers come up to me and say, hey, Greg, where are you from, man? I said, uh, you know where I'm from. So, are you African American? <laughs> I said, brother, I got a USA passport. I'm American. And they're all like, ha, 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 laughed at me. And they said, yeah, you're right, man, you're right. I said, I know I'm right, because I know you come from a very particular part of Africa. You are from Ghana, Cameroon, uh, Nigeria, Zulu. You know, I don't know my tribe. So I can't say I'm African American. But I will say I'm an American of African descent. And that's how I dealt with those cats. And they let me go. <laughs> nothing, being, nothing like being ridiculed by Africans. You know, I mean, I love those guys, but man, they were ready to barbecue me. So I said, okay, we can, you know, peace. Here I am. So that's, that's I, I like to say I'm a black artist, or an artist, uh, or Negro. And, and, and when I was in South Africa, color was not a good thing. Because I, I was considered the people who beat up the, the Africans colored folks. And that was the white folks gave out the rules and the colors dished out the paint. And I'm like, oh, uh, <laughs> I can't use the word color here. So uh, it worked being American. And I did a lot of speaking. Well, I, I have a different point of view. I, I'm proud to be considered an African American artist um, because it pay, I don't, doesn't matter to me whether my folks came from Nigeria or Ghana or whatever by way of Trinidad, because it, to me it pays, it's like I'm honoring my ancestors because I'm only here because somebody survived the slave ship. Somebody survived the passage. Somebody worked in those cotton fields or rice fields. Somebody survived the, the, the you know, the whip. And, and whatever atrocities that happened to them, somebody, you know, was scrubbing those floors. And, you know, I look a little light, but I mean, we had that one drop rule here in America. <laughs> so that, Jeanette, I would not be here, whatever, it didn't even matter the percentage, I would not be here without someone surviving to get me to where I'm in. So when, if someone calls me an African American artist, it's just for me paying homage to where I come from. And I'm, I'm happy to be labeled that. And my work is different. My work is just work. My paintings are just paintings. If somebody wants to call them black paintings, whatever. But for myself, as a title, I, 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 um, I'm proud of it. I'm very proud of it. And proud that my work is maybe in major museums and, and that someone can say, oh, well, that's an African American artist. I know that as a young child going to the museum to know that a particular a tanner was by an African American mm -hmm. artist and for that to be somehow denoted in the, uh, you know, the, the talking about the work or something on the wall, that, that inspired me. And if that label wasn't there uh, and, and with the abstract work or whatever, I wouldn't necessarily know. And so I'm happy to be part of that tribe. But anyway. <laughs> well, well uh, I guess I agree with Stephanie. And I think for me, because the first thing that you see, I'm a big black man. <laughs> Getting bigger. And, 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 and then I remember I was doing the mural for the Olympics, and 
And there were a group of black kids. They had no idea I was black. And when I walked into the room, their whole faces just changed. I mean, they started listening. They started, and this one little boy said, I can be an artist. Mm-hmm. You know? So, so for me, I don't mind being an African American because it's going to always be that way. And it's getting, it's getting worse in this, in this economy. And it's, it's funny, I have to tell this quick story. I'm doing a piece for the airport. And so I asked, I went to the airport for, for 49 days. I asked uh, uh, 142 people what was the thing that they feared? The, well, I mean, give me positive words. And what were the things that they, and, and after the election, what things did they fear the most? 137 said fear after the election. Mm-hmm. All nationalities, they said fear. And when you look at what's happening in, in the political climate, as an African American male, you know, it's, it's like I, I have to have a conversation with my son if he gets stopped by the cops. You know, look here, stay, keep your hands where they should be. And I was explaining to a friend of mine, I said, you didn't, I didn't have to have that conversation with your son. But I had to have, I had to say, Skyler, do this. So I'm going to, I mean, I don't mind being, being that. Hopefully one day when I get to heaven, I'll be American. <laughs> 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 well, you know, I think that this is a conversation that I think every time we get around and, and, and sit and talk about, this is an old conversation, African-American versus American artists. Uh, I think the artist always produces work considered his environment or his point of view or who he's around or what he reads or what he concerned about. And that may not always necessarily be the African-American subject. Well, like I say, Henry mm-hmm. O'Tan. No, you know, I mean, I named my son, my first son named Tam. And, uh, but I believe that, you know, you probably would never know. Bannister, I mean, you know, this is African American art. I think, uh, it, what I think is a, a kind of elephant in the room with, when we talk about African American versus American art, we all Americans, mm-hmm. clearly. We also African Americans. However, I went to the University of Maryland. Because of the David Driscoll Center, I'm a part of University of Maryland's official collection. I'm not in my alma mater's collection anywhere. University of Maryland, College of Art, not there. Same artist, why not? There is a, there's a divide. I mean, I believe that how, uh, you know, if there were not, is another thing. Whether they want to say it or not, they don't do this a lot now, but a long time ago, what, you know, uh, what they used to do, the affinity stuff. Absolute. Freddie, you were in there with me, right? Mm-hmm. Absolute Violence? Yeah, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. We were in the African American segment. We weren't in there with the regular, you know. No. So I'm saying, you know, it's just a catch 22 that there are certain artists among us who were very famous and were both people that it mean a lot to the art world and to who's affected me. That, there are people who don't want to be considered African American. If there's an art, there's a label on their name. It's inescapable. I mean, I think if you look at my imagery, you would know who I am. It, it is, or you would know what I care about, or what I'm concerned about. Uh, but I would like to be known, we all would like to be known as America. America, I, I would, I'll speak for myself. However, I am absolutely proud, and, and you know, it's in, it's, it's, it's no mistake in that if you see my work, it's the work of a black man of, of, from a perspective of that of a, a black person. So I believe that this uh, this catch one and two, I think. Uh, I agree with uh, Gregory <laughs> earlier who said check all the boxes and uh, check all the boxes for me, African American, Negro, Southern, gay, male, whatever. Check all the boxes and maybe you'll find me. <laughs> well, I, um, I prefer African American over black and gatherings like this where we were all black, 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 I would kind of, you know, I'm very shy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. wow. I would raise my hand and say, <laughs> when I look at the photograph of my father's grandfather who looked like the Indians in the cowboy movies, and then when I look at those white men who visited 
my mother's mother, who were her uncles, I'm more than just what got off the boat. I'm a mixture of all of those things. And I think us African Americans, other than Native Americans, are the most unique Americans because we were created here. A mixture of what got off the boat and who visited and mixed with us when we got here. <laughs> we can't go back to Ireland. We can't do none of that. We were created right here on this continent. So we are, I think, the most unique Americans in America. You like questions now, right? Yeah, you listen a lot of response. <laughs> Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. African, African American artists is fine mm -hmm. because we are, they, but these guys are African Americans who are artists. I don't like for our art to be defined as black art. Me neither. Right, no, right. no, no. I mean, yeah. Is it black paintings? So, because I don't call work by white artists white art. No. Mm -hmm. So, the, the one distinction that I think we all do not like, especially when we consider serious art, serious fine art collecting, we absolutely don't like the term black art. So uh, that, I think, is the only big distinction. I think mm -hmm. we'll go by whatever you call it, just so you buy the work, right? <laughs> uh, well, almost anything. But, but I think that's the big distinction for most of the black artists. I agree with Mike on that. And I think every artist on this panel have had the experience of having their work hung with so-called the creme de la creme of American artists, and our work holds up with, with that work. Mm -hmm. September did a show at this law firm. You were there, Kevin. Yes. They had the cream of the crop of yeah, white Russian American Russian. artists, and they hung our work up in there, and our work held, up, held its own beside that work. Mm -hmm. So it's just artwork. It's plain and simple. It's not black, it's not green, it's just art. It, it, it's one of the things I, I teach at SCAD. I tell teachers to write in a sketchbook, good art is a result of intelligent decision making. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Choice making, mm -hmm. decision making. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yep. I don't. Till, I don't. Peace. What? Yeah. Uh, a white, um, Dana Schultz. Yeah, a, a white guy. He, he did Emmett Till. A woman. A woman, yeah. Yeah. Schultz. Is it a painting that with respect or is it something? Well, I've seen the painting on the internet. I didn't go to the <coughs> exhibition. Um, I didn't actually read, I actually read first a complimentary article about the show in terms of her work and a gentleman, Henry Taylor, whose work I admire. So I didn't actually read the subsequent article, I think in The Guardian, that somehow seemed to suggest that Dana did not have the right to make that painting. So I did, I did not read the article, so I can't comment on the article, but I know the woman's work, I'm familiar with her work, and I feel like she has every right to make that painting. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see any controversy no. there whatsoever. She, she did not do it in such a way that did not respect mm -hmm. what she was painting. It wasn't done tongue in cheek or she did not you know, denigrate or make fun of. Mm -hmm. she, she did it very respectfully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So why I don't which, I don't understand like what the mother, which was like his mother did. That's and the idea. person who wrote the article, I did not necessarily think they were coming from an African American point of view, saying this is ours, you can't have it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so the writer was just commenting on what was already happening. That wasn't necessarily the writer's point of view. No, I just think it's silly. I think, yeah. you know, artistic expression, mm -hmm. open, people should be able to paint what they want, do what they want. Yeah. American who was standing in front of the painting 
blocking people's view every day. Really? Wow. It's a form of protest, yes. Wow. I'm surprised that, don't they hire guards for yeah, like... Yeah, they take the those crazy <laughs> folk out of there. <laughs> well, I see what you're saying, just kind of standing there, but not exactly doing yeah, anything I mean, wrong. He's not, he's not uh, threatening the painting or anything. I just wish he had a job to go to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, well, I got to wrap it up. Yeah. Simple. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but we'd like to thank the, the artist. No. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>